when we find a general antiderivative for a function, we are looking at what function you would create such that its derivative would give you the original function back. Uh, when you take the derivative of an algebraic term, you multiply the coefficient by the exponent, and then you subtract one from your exponent. That's called the power rule. When you go backwards, you just reverse your steps. You add one to the exponent, and you divide by the results you get. For example, this first term, x to the fourth, if you add one to the power, that gives you five. And then you divide by the result, five. Any constant, it will have an antiderivative where you take the constant and you put a variable with it. Now, you, it's not wrong to write 1x, but you don't have to write the 1. It's an understood coefficient if no coefficient is written. This plus c is called a constant of integration, and any constant has a derivative of 0, which does not show up in your original problem, but when you solve differential equations or... Some of the problems we'll actually have in Cal 1 or in this class, Cal 2, you might be asked to find what the value of that constant of integration is under some initial conditions. But for our purposes, this is just review in Cal 2 of taking antiderivatives. So you add 1 to the power, divide by the result, that's x to the fifth over 5. You can also write that 1 fifth x to the fifth. And then 1 is a constant, just put a variable with that 1. And then don't forget your plus C. In the second example, we're taking the general antiderivative. It's called an indefinite integral of x to the 3 halves plus 4x plus 7. 3 halves plus 1 is 5 halves. Divide by the result. 4x, when you add 1, you get 4x squared. Divided by the result. 7 is a constant. So stick a variable on it. Don't forget your constant of integration. Dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So that's what I did on this step. Is I Instead of dividing by 5 halves, we're multiplying by 2 fifths. It just makes the problem look cleaner in the end. 4 over 2 is 2, and then the rest is, stays the same. In the third example we took the integral of square root of x plus 1 over 4 times the square root of x. Remember that radicals, and this is an algebra property, radicals can be written as fraction powers. Whatever root you're taking will be the denominator's number. For example, square root will have a 2 in the denominator. And same thing on the second term, we have 1 over 4 x to the half. 1 over 4 x to the half. Another exponent property that you had in algebra was anytime you move a term across a fraction bar, you change the sign of its exponent. So on the second step, going into the third step, everything stays the same, except I moved x to the one half to the numerator. And if you do that, you have to negate your exponent. Now let's carry forth with the general antiderivative rule. So starting with our first term, x to the half. Add 1 to your power, you get 3 halves. Divide by the result, 1 fourth times, and now we're going to take negative half and add 1. That's positive half. Divide by the result is 1 half. Dividing by 3 halves and multiplying by 2 thirds is the same thing. So this is just to clean up the term. And then 4 times 1 half is 2. That will stay in the denominator. If you were to flip one half over, it's two over four, which also reduces to a half. And don't forget your constant of integration. With a general antiderivative or a indefinite integral, these are also called indefinite integrals because you don't have definite numbers for lower and upper limits. And videos, a couple videos into the YouTube channel, we cover definite integrals, and you'll see numbers at the bottom and the top of this elongated S. The integral symbol is an elongated S stretching back to Riemann sums. It's just a little interesting history piece. Um, the next example, 
we have the integral of x plus 3 over square root of x. I'm going to do two things at once here. I'm going to break this up into two separate terms with a common denominator. So it's going to be x over square root of x plus 3 over square root of x dx. But at the same time, I know this radical, I'm going to change that to x to the 1 half like we did in the example above. So we have x to the first over x to the half. And then our second term is plus 3 over x to the 1 half. Common denominator, so you can split a fraction up. However many pieces the numerator has, you can break it up into that many terms. When you have like terms stacked in a fraction, you subtract their exponents. So we have an x to the 1 on top minus x to the half. So x divided by x to the half, that's x to the 1 minus half, which is half. Now this, like the last example, I'm going to carry it to the numerator, put it up there next to the 3. The 1 half will become negative once that term crosses the fraction bar. Now we'll go to our general antiderivative property. Starting with the first term, add 1 to your power. A half plus 1 is 3 halves. Divide by the result. x to the negative half, when you add 1 to the power, it becomes positive half. Divide by the result. Our first term, to get rid of the complex fraction, you take the reciprocal of 3 halves. That's 2 thirds x to the 3 halves. It makes a cleaner term. And then 3 times 2, because dividing by a half and multiplying by 2 is the same thing, that gives us 6x to the 1 half plus our constant of integration. I would personally leave these as fraction powers instead of converting them back to radical forms. You can certainly do that if you like. The next example we have the integral of 4 cosine x plus 7 i, excuse me, plus 7 sine x dx. These are just straightforward trig antiderivatives. Um, I did go over some properties of integrals in class, just as a reminder from the end of Cal 1. Scalar coefficients or multiples can be pulled out front of your integral symbol. And terms with a plus or a minus, you can split those up. So the antiderivative of cosine x is sine x. So that's 4 sine x. The second term, the antiderivative of sine x, is negative cosine x. That's a tricky one. You've got to watch your sign. But anyway, long story short, it gives you a negative 7 cosine x plus c. I hope this video has helped. If you have any questions, reach out by phone or email. Come by the office if you're on campus. And I'll do my best to help you out.